This is a free recording by Cambridge Cookbooks Etc. We hope you enjoy and benefit from the content. Also, please consider donating to the new Cambridge Mosque. Please visit Cambridge Mosque is moving dot org dot uk. Alhamdulillah, Alhamdulillah, the Lady Anzala Allah Abdi in Kitaba, while I'm Yaja Allah who I was at. Koyima, the Umdira Batsan Shadida Miladun, where you Bashir al Mu'minin and Ladina Yamalun, a stolly hat and Nalahom Ajran Hatana, Makitina Fidi Abada, where you Umdira Ladina Fallu Tafad Allah who Walada, Malahom Bihi Min Ilm. ولا لآبائهم كبرت كلمة تخرج من أفواههم إن يقولون إلا كذبا وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له له الملك وله الحمد وإليه المصير وأشهد أن سيدنا محمدا عبده ورسوله أرسله الله تعالى بالحق بشيرا ونذيرا بين يدي الساعة من يطع الله ورسوله فقد فاز ومن يعصيهما فقد ضل ضلالا بعيدا اللهم صل وسلم وبارك عليه وعلى اله واصحابه واتباعه وازواجه وذريته جميعا اما بعد فيا ايها الاخوه المؤمنون السلام عليكم ورحمه الله وبركاته قال الله تبارك وتعالى في القران الكريم اعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وَإِنْ يُرِيدُوا أَنْ يَخْتَعُوكَ فَإِنَّ حَسْبَكَ اللَّهِ هُوَ الَّذِي أَيَّدَكَ بِنَصْرِهِ وَبِالْمُؤْمِنِينَ وَأَلَّفَ بَيْنَ قُلُوبِهِمْ لَوْ أَنْفَقْتَ مَا فِي الْأَرْضِ جَمِيعًا مَا أَلَّفْتَ بَيْنَ قُلُوبِهِمْ وَلَكِنَّ اللَّهَ أَلَّفَ بَيْنَهُمْ إِنَّهُ عَزِيزٌ حَكِيمٌ صدق الله العظيم الله سبحانه وتعالى says and if they wish to deceive you then know that Allah is enough for you. It is He who gave you victory through His support and with the believers. Had you, and He is the one who brought their hearts together. Had you spent all of the wealth that is upon the earth, you would not have brought their hearts together, but Allah brought them together. Truly He is mighty, wise. This is an ayah which was revealed after the Battle of Badr, the Quraysh have retreated to lick their wounds. And the prospect is of, of course, them coming back for revenge. And this verse is sent to remind the believers that it was through Allah's victory that that victory was granted. And that the unbelievers might well deceive them. Because the, there was going to be a time of calm, a time of truce. Wa in silmi, laha wa tawakkal ala Allah. And if they incline to peace, then incline you to peace also and rely on Allah. Have tawakkul. You don't know really what they're going to do. There might be a sneak attack. They might simply be, as it were, moving back in order to take a bigger leap, rearming, remilitarizing. But you should rely on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Tawakkal ala Allah. Rely on Allah. Now what is going on with the Quraysh at this time? What they are doing is gathering troops. But they are also gathering wealth. They're materialists. They're merchants. And they think in terms of restoring the power balance so that it is the way they like it, through material means. Specifically through gaining money and spending money to pay off tribes and to get them to join their coalition, as it were, a coalition of the willing. They do it through money. And they get the money through loans. The temptation in Medina was to do the same thing. The Muslims of Badr had been very few. The possibility of acquiring the kind of wealth that would bring in auxiliaries from the desert in order to strengthen their forces was very limited. But in these verses, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling them to rely on him. And many of the verses to do with riba are also from this period. Ya ayyuhal ladina amanu la ta'kulu riba ad'afan muda'afa O you who believe, do not consume riba in compound interest. 
أضعاف المضاعفة interest and interest upon interest and we all know how the modern economies love to do that واتقوا الله and fear Allah fear Allah rely on Allah that is better than engaging in some kind of manipulation of the money markets in order to pay for your military needs this has an application for our situation today because Europe is now in a state of crisis and the crisis has a lot to do with power and a lot to do with money and a lot to do with speculation you could say that the thing that's in our headlines recently has been the Arab Spring but really no less important has been what you might call the European Autumn which is the collapse apparently imminent, expected, feared of the European Union the great achievement of Europe, the dream that they never achieved since the time of the Roman Empire. Even the Romans were unable to bring in people like the Germans. It was just too much for them. But they thought in the 50s, 60s, 70s that this was going to be the new reality, the new superpower, which would counterbalance the uh, bipolar world of the Soviet Union and of the United States, the rise of Europe. But it's not really looking that way. Money is short. And hence, what do they do? They borrow and they borrow, and they borrow. Look at the situation of the Greeks at the moment. Greek universities have just imposed a 20% pay cut on all lecturers. And there's another 10% pay cut coming up. The government has just laid off 150,000 public service workers, civil servants. About 20% of the workforce suddenly lost. 50% of young people in Greece are on the dole. You can go there as a tourist. The beaches are full, but the museums are closed. Many of the libraries are closed. The place is shutting down. It's a crisis, and it's a crisis upon a crisis. And they all know what the reason is. The people who are on the streets protesting, it's not their fault. It's not the fault of the young people. It's the fault of the old people who borrowed and borrowed and borrowed, thinking that when the young people became old people, they would pay it all back. Just postponing it. And the more you have a stable and a confident and an arrogant economic system, the more you rely on your manipulation of finite resources rather than trusting in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and just restraining your desires. The more you do that, the more you tend to defer um, payback time. Your children will pay it back. Even your grandchildren will pay it back. But you, the politician who's in his 60s and 70s, you won't have to face payback time yourself. As John Maynard Keynes, the economist, said, in the long term we are all dead. So you just postpone it. You postpone it and you postpone it. But unfortunately what happens when well, the banks start to creak and people call in the loans? That's when you have this extraordinary catastrophe. And it's the weakest who go to the wall first. It's the people who are already nearly hungry who are the ones who become hungry before the fat cats and, of course, the bankers themselves the last to relinquish their troops. This is the situation that is now unfolding on the fringes of Europe, not just in Greece, but in other countries, sometimes they call them the peaks countries, Portugal and Italy and Greece and Spain. They're all on the brink of something unimaginable. A bank can collapse because of manipulation of riba. If a government collapses, then the banks can't be guaranteed, and if there is sovereign debt, 100% of GDP, 200% of GDP and counting in Greece, who bails out the government? And what happens if the government can't pay anybody? even the police, you have what you had in Somalia 20 years ago, the IMF wouldn't give them another loan to pay back the irresponsible loans that Ziad Biri and his socialist administration had contracted, dumping them on the head of a future generation of Somalis, and Riba eventually caused the catastrophe that is Somalia. You couldn't pay the police, the government collapsed, the rich people went into exile in Italy and France, and the poor people were um, destitute, and the catastrophe continues all because of riba, all because of greed. The one reason why those verses in the Qur'an about riba are so strong. Because not only do you lose your personal freedom if you're chained by financial obligations through the miserable burden of debt to others, you lose your freedom, so you lose your dignity, you lose your hope, you lose your horizons. What can you do other than pay it back? And young people with the student loans are facing that, and under the new provisions... If you don't pay it back early, you may be paying back the final instalment uh, on the money that you paid to the University of Cambridge when you're 50 years old. That's half of your life just under the burden of debt. 
We know how important this is in Islam, to be free of debt. Things like doing hajj are only really possible when you have paid off your debts, because Allah wishes us to have this dignity. Dignity is fundamental for human beings, and autonomy is fundamental to that dignity. What happens when a whole country goes belly up? This is a year of anniversaries. 2012, Muslims remember anniversaries in particular. 1912, the Balkan Wars, the final collapse of Islam in Europe, with everybody invading simultaneously and the European powers sort of looking the other way and pretending that they weren't terribly interested. That was only made possible because the Ottomans in the mid and late 19th century had done a deal with international bankers, and the Rothschilds in particular, selling the future of their country so that they could do whatever they thought they needed to do in the 1850s and the 1860s, and eventually um, that came back to haunt them. Uh, another anniversary would be um, 1882, the British invasion of Egypt, the bombardment of Alexandria, the heroes of the Royal Navy, without any possibility of the Egyptians striking back, bombarding Alexandria and hundreds and hundreds of people killed, and then they invaded. One reason for that was that the Egyptians uh, were fed up of their dependence on foreign powers, which was caused by the endless burden of debt repayments, and Ahmed Gorabi Pasha took over as a popular figure, and the British didn't fancy this too much. They invaded and put in the Khadiv Tawfiq. Despite the fatwas of the Azhar, Egypt lost its independence. Basically <coughs> because of riba, chaining the future of the country so that the present-day elite can have treats. This is dangerous. Whole countries can fall into slavery through this practice of riba. Now, one aspect of this is that it's not just about Europe, but it's even the United States. What are the long-term consequences of a lot of wars? The Quraysh had to pay heavily for their wars against Medina. Americans are paying very heavily for their various wars. Iraq costs three trillion, four trillion, depending on what do you think it cost. Afghanistan has already cost them one trillion and counting. There's only so many trillions that you have in the coffers. <coughs> what you've done is to pay uh, on the never never. Treasury bonds, more and more treasury bonds. War after war, and if they go for Iran, that'll be even more expensive, and somebody will have to pay for it. The poor old US taxpayer will have to pay for it, and in the long term, his children, his grandchildren, will have to pay for it because the government won't be able to pay for even Obamacare, probably because the money simply won't be there. They're mortgaging their future. And this too has consequences. The American empire will not be a thousand year Reich. Countries come, countries go. Tilkal ayyamu nudawilu habin and nets. Those days of glory we cause them to succeed amongst human beings. The Pharaohs have their day, the Israelites have their day, and ancient Persia has its day. No Bidi rules forever. No dynasty lasts forever. The British Empire thought it was going for a very long time, but now where is it? The Falklands, South Georgia, a few specks somewhere in the Pacific. It's um, hardly anything at all gone without a trace. The Americans, by doing this, are mortgaging their future. But instead of getting angry, we should give them the nasiha. Debt is dangerous. The riba is really dangerous. Don't burden your children with such burdens that eventually they rebel. You don't know what the consequences of that might be. Recently, a Greek politician said, all it takes is for one of our rubber bullets to kill a protester by mistake and we'll have a revolution on our hands and we won't be able to cope with it. They're really angry. Who knows where the breaking point might be. And in America, of course, they've also been paying off Reba on another front, the so-called subprime mortgage scandal, one of the worst-kept secrets of the Bush administration, was that because of deregulation, and that started under Clinton, but... Uh, Bush and Greenspan were very keen on it as well, that they massively increased the amount of public debt. So much for fiscal probity and conservative uh, policies and small government, uh, that's not what they did in practice. That was the rhetoric, that was the promise in the election 2001, but that's not what actually happened. What happened was that the federal <coughs> government had these two gov government banks, effectively government banks, colloquially known as Freddie Mae and Freddie Mac, whose function was to facilitate homeowning by poorer Americans. Traditionally, you only give a mortgage to somebody who can obviously pay it back. 
is in a career, is in a stable job, a stable relationship, the form that you fill out is not. And then, because these were kind of government banks and they were appointing the government regulators, and Bush was happy to turn a blind eye to that, what happened was that they broke that rule and you had the subprime lending. Some reformed alcoholic who's got a part-time job at Burger King, now he can get a mortgage promising that he'll be paying back in 20 years, 30 years. And then they package those mortgages and turned them into securities, which could then be traded on the bond market, and they became junk bonds, toxic assets, and eventually the whole house of cards collapsed, and you had the 2008 catastrophe, and the whole world is suffering as a result, particularly poor Americans, some of whom don't have enough to eat. The rich guys are still in their big houses blaming somebody else, but it's the poor who always suffer, and it is the poor for whom the Sharia and Allah's law is principally legislated. So they have dug themselves into this hole. And where is the money going? The money is being bought. The debt is being bought. And it's going to the Gulf, and it's going to India to some extent. Some of it's going to Brazil. Some of it's going to China. Saudi Arabian Central Bank announced that it's increased its holdings of U.S. Treasury bonds by 12% last year, which was a major increase. They've now got $350 billion worth of American sovereign debt and a 3.8% uh, percent interest, that's pretty good. Increasingly, the Saudi economy is propelled by the interest payments that are uh, caused by the fact that they're buying so many U.S. Treasury bonds. It's 350 billion is significant. In China, they have even more. So it's been calculated that in just three years' time, 2015, they will be receiving so many interest payments from, ultimately, the U.S. taxpayer that uh, the entire budget of the Chinese armed forces will be paid for by the US taxpayer. The People's Liberation Army subsidized completely a free gift from the people of the United States. That wasn't really what was supposed to happen. Again, you see the loss of sovereignty. China is moving up. You know, they have very few mortgages. They're not affected by this crisis. Um, and the other countries that are going down are the countries that um, were hooked by the bait of riba. But back to Europe, finally. America may not fragment the rich states, the poor states, but Europe is starting to do that. The myth of the European Union. Remember what the Holy Prophet وسلم, is doing. The Quraysh spent all that they could in order to try and get the tribes to gang up on Medina, and ultimately it failed. They had been freaked out by the spectacle of the Muslim army at Badr, because the tribes weren't even together, they were all mixed up together. And the Muhajireen and the Ansar it blew their minds. No such thing had ever been seen in Arabia. If you spend everything that is upon the earth, you couldn't bring together their hearts. For thousands upon thousands of years, they've been at each other's throats. There's been no law in Arabia. It's just every tribe for itself. And now, fighting together against the top dogs of Mecca, the Quraysh, very strange. But it worked, and it worked without river. How did it work? Because of this technique of Qulu, this unity of the hearts. And let's just remember as a final point that that too almost started to unravel after the death of the Holy Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. One of his many staggering achievements was uniting those people through faith. Faith in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who is so above tribe that tribe means nothing in his eyes or in the eyes of those who are worshipping together equally in the masjid of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Tribalism obliterated. People still had the surnames but it meant nothing in the eyes of the new sharia. Whereas before their conversion it had been the centre of their identity. Suddenly erased. After his death sallallahu alayhi wa sallam we find the three heroes. Abu Bakr and Omar and Abu Ubaidah ibn al-Jarrah, they're in the mosque, and the tragedy of the Prophet's death has been announced. Abu Bakr goes in, and he sees the Holy Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, dead, and he kisses him on the cheek, cheeks, and he said, مَا أَقْتِيَبَكَ يَا رَسُولُ اللَّهِ حَيًّا وَمَيْتًا How pure you are, a messenger of God, living and dead. And he leaves his family to deal with the washing and the burial. And he has heard that some political catastrophe is happening elsewhere in Medina. Unity is starting to fray. Another group of the believers has met in a place called the Saqifa of the Bani Sa'ida, which is a kind of veranda a few hundred meters away in Medina, and it's mainly the Ansar 
and they're starting to divide along tribal lines. The old tribes of uh, Aus, led by Usaid ibn Qadair, and the tribe of Khazraj, led by Sa'ad ibn Ubada. And they are saying, people of Mecca, Muhajirin, they can have their Amir, but we want to be independent now with our tribes. Wa minna Amir, we will also have an Amir. So the three men make haste to that place, and they have to be there in time before they appoint an Amir, and the old tribal ways uh, come back. And they get there just in time. And there's famous speeches in that Abu Bakr gives a speech. And many of the Khazraj are doubtful. Uh, but uh, Sayyidina Omar saves the day. Radiallahu anhu. Upsut yadak ya Rasulullah. He's a big man with a big voice. Everybody can hear, although there's maybe a thousand people there. Upsut yadak ya Rasulullah. Put out your hand. Upsut yadak ya Abu Bakr. Put out your hand, O Abu Bakr. Fala ubayak. And I shall pledge you, pledge my allegiance to you. And he does it for Baya Abu Omar. And he makes a speech about the greatness of Abu Bakr and the need for the Muslims to stay together. And then Abu Ubaidah ibn al Jarrah also does so. He's one of the Mubashirin bil Jannah, one of the great ones of the Sahaba. And by force of character and by reminding these people, uh, these tribal people, of the need for the Muslims to stay together, uh, they win the day and the unity of the Ummah is preserved. And some of the tribes do rebel in Central Arabia and in Yemen and elsewhere, but still, such is the energy generated by the revolution of Allah's Messenger that they stay together, and money is not entering into the uh, operation in any significant way. It's this ta'lif al the unification of the heart, which was one of the greatest legacies of Allah's Messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So we need to remember this. As people in Muslim countries start to fly apart, tribes in Yemen, tribes in Libya, sects here and there, we need to remember this basic principle of unity. And however much we may think we can pay people off, unless there is this sense of Muslim unity, we will just start to go the way that the European Union is going and that other countries are going. We will effectively have become people of the Jahiliyyah again. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, with his love for the Ummah, protect us from that. أوصيكم ونفسي بتقوى الله فإنه خير الزاد وإياكم محدثات الأمور فكل محدثة بدعة وكل بدعة ضلالة وكل ضلالة في النار واعلموا أن الله قد أمركم بأمر عظيم أمركم بالصلاة والسلام على سيد الأنبياء والمرسلين فقال جل ثناؤه إن الله وملائكته يصلون على النبي يا أيها الذين آمنوا صلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما اللهم صل على محمد وعلى آل محمد كما صليت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم إنك حميد مجيد وبارك على محمد وعلى آل محمد كما باركت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم في العالمين إنك حميد مجيد اللهم إنا نسألك رضاك والجنة ونعوذ بك من سخطك والنار ربنا لا تزيق قلوبنا بعد إذ هديتنا وحب لنا من لدنك رحمة إنك أنت الوهاب ووفق اللهم ولاة أمور المسلمين إلى العمل بكتاب الله وسنة سيد الأنبياء والمرسلين عباد الله رحمكم الله إن الله يأمر بالعدل والإخسان وإيتاء ذي القربى وينهى عن الفحشاء والمنكر والبغي يعزكم لعلكم تذكرون اذكروا الله العظيم يذكركم وادعوه يستجب لكم ولذكر الله أكبر والله يعلم ما تصنعون